you would open up your Bibles with me today to Proverb 31. Proverb 31. And again, I'm asking if you'd remain standing just for a moment in honor of the word of the living God. Many of you know, uh, last week we started a brand new series that we have simply entitled Family Matters. And this series is going to take us right into Father's Day. We've devoted the next eight weeks together talking about family matters because family matters. And so over these eight weeks, we're going to be looking at a lot of different issues facing the family today because we believe that God still is into the family Family was God's idea, family is God's idea, family will always be God's idea until he comes again. And then if you stop and think about it, even after he comes again, for all of eternity, we are going to dwell together as the family of Almighty God. So there's never going to be a time when we are not family because God has revealed himself as a father through Jesus Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. We are sons and daughters of the Lord, but we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And you can pick your friends, but you cannot pick your family. I uh, mean, we're stuck together through the blood of Jesus Christ. So you better learn how to get along down here because you're going to be up there forever and forever and forever. And there's no way to escape them. And so, in fact, I believe that your room is going to be right next to the one you can't get along with here on this earth. You're going to spend eternity with them. I can't prove that through the Bible, but I do believe it in my heart. But we're always going to be family. So we need to learn how to get along here. Here. We need to learn the dynamics of a healthy family. And today we're going to talk about our moms and our ladies because we believe moms matter. Turn to your neighbor and tell them moms matter in Jesus' name. Proverb 31 in verse number one. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy, some versions say, ruin kings. If you drop down to verse 10, he will continue and say, an excellent wife who can find, this is still his mother speaking, she is far more precious than jewels. Drop down to verse number 28. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Proverb 14 and verse 1, Solomon made this observation. The wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. I want to share with you this morning a message I've simply entitled, The Beauty of a God-Fearing Woman. Ladies, you will never be more attractive to God than when you walk in the fear of the Lord. And with that fear of the Lord comes a beauty that will never fade away and has a way of impacting generations to come for the glory and the honor of his great name. Father, I ask over these next few moments that you take the very simple words that we've read today and just a few comments that I have and that you'd minister to your daughters as only you can. I pray that somehow I would be taken out of the equation because many ladies are probably going to discount what I say because I'm a man. But I don't stand before them as a man. I just stand before them as a messenger. And I only want to speak the words that you have revealed in your scriptures so that our ladies can be different than the rest of the women in this world. That they would walk in the fear of the Lord and that they would make the contribution to this world that only they can make. And we thank you for it. 
in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Would you put your hands together one more time and give the Lord all the praise. Amen. And before you're seated, turn to your neighbor and tell him you love him in Jesus' name. I believe this with all of my heart. And I say that because I, I want you to know I'm not just trying to be dramatic. I believe this with all of my heart. It is impossible to overstate the significant influence that a mother has on her home, on her marriage, on her children, and on her family. In fact, so significant is her influence upon the family, upon her husband, upon her children, upon her home, that long after she goes to be with her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the legacy that she leaves will live on. I believe that there is something about a mother, and I, after all of these years, I, I still don't know what it is, but there is something about a mom and her attitude and the way that she conducts herself that sets the tone of that home emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. I don't want to take away from the significant contribution of a husband, and we'll talk about that on Father's Day, but there is something about a mom that even when a man is not really where he needs to be, there is something about a mom that can stabilize that home and can set the tone of that home emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. So much so that generations after mom has passed on, the legacy that she leaves will live on. So ladies, I ask you today, what will be your legacy? What will you leave with your children that will continue to their children and to their children and for generations to come? Because believe me, you have been given gifts that are unique to you that have a significant influence upon your children. And if you leverage those gifts that God has given to you properly, then you can set a spiritual course for years and years to come for the glory and the honor of God. So I ask you again, ladies, what will your legacy be? You know, I read this poem the other day, and it's from an unknown author, but I believe it captures the progression of a son's or a daughter's thoughts concerning the wisdom and the influence of their mother. It's called Images of Mother. It says, four years of age, my mommy can do anything. Eight years of age, my mom knows a lot, a whole lot. How many of you remember that stage? 12 years of age, my mother doesn't really know quite everything. 14 years of age, naturally, mother doesn't know that either. 16 years of age, mother, she's out of it. 18 years of age, that old woman, she doesn't know anything. 25 years of age, well, mom might know a little about it. 35 years of age, before we decide, let's get mom's opinion. 45 years of age, I wonder what mom would have thought about it. 65 years of age, I wish I could talk it over with mom. If you still have your mom at 65, God bless you, and some do. You know, let's be honest, this all sounds really familiar. It really does. And isn't it sad how we all too often let our inexperienced youth rob us of the wisdom that our mothers and our fathers really have? Because you know, when you were in your teens, just like this poem says, when you were in your 20s, you thought you knew it all. And that you were smarter than your mom, you were smarter than your dad. And then only when you get older do you realize all of the pain and all of the hurt that could have been avoided had you simply been humble enough to experience the wisdom that they had to pass on to you. Truly, our mothers have a very profound influence upon our lives and our development. Now, many of you know that Solomon was... For all intent and purposes, the wisest man that ever walked on the face of the earth saved Jesus Christ. 
If you know his story, you know that he was uniquely gifted by Almighty God to be able to look at the created world through human behavior and even the animal kingdom and was able to draw out incredible principles of God and incredible wisdom and insight. Anything from empty-headed, empty-hearted men walking the way of loose women and falling into destruction, even to ants gathering food for the winter, Solomon had this unique ability to just look at the created world and draw from it incredible wisdom. And here in Proverbs 14, Solomon observed that wise, godly women build their homes on the godly wisdom they have amassed in their life by walking in the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord. And with that wisdom, they build their husbands, they build their children, they build their family, they build their home in such a way that I believe even the gates of hell cannot prevail against it for the glory and the honor of his name. But he also observed that there were foolish, stubborn, and rebellious women who tear down their husbands, tear down their marriages, tear down their homes, tear down their families, tear down their children with their own hands. What he means there is with works that are not restrained by that godly fear. So as far as the economy of God is concerned, there are only two kinds of women here today. There are women who fear the Lord, and walk reverently and worshipfully before him and gain great wisdom that is building up their family in such a way that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And there are foolish, rebellious women who do not fear the Lord, whose lives are not restrained by their reverent awe for the Lord. And they tear down their families, their marriages, their children, and do great and extensive damage simply because they move by instinct and not out of a genuine worship to the living God Almighty. Consider that today, ladies. Proverbs 31 is a beautiful tribute to godly women. It really is. And I know that a lot of women are intimidated to read Proverbs 31, but I hope to take some of that intimidation away because it it may mean a little bit more than you think, and, and maybe it will take some of that pressure off of you this morning. Proverbs 31, I I believe, is expounding upon that principle of Proverbs 14. Many of you know that it was written, as it says right here, by a king named King Lemuel. Now, I got to tell you as your pastor that there's been a great debate and great discussion as to the identity of King Lemuel, because he's unknown. We don't know anything about this king. We don't read anything about him. It's very possible that King Lemuel was actually a foreign king from a foreign land who had been greatly influenced by the wisdom of Solomon. We know that many nations and kings would pay tribute to sit at the feet of Solomon and hear the great wisdom that he possessed. And so it's very possible that King Lemuel and his mother were foreign kings and that they actually paid to be in the presence of Solomon and they are simply writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the wisdom that was communicated to them by King Solomon. But there are other scholars who believe that it's quite possible that Lemuel was a nickname or was a pet name that was given to Solomon when he was a little boy and that King Lemuel is actually Solomon and that his mother was Bathsheba. The reality is we will never know this side of eternity who King Lemuel was. He may have been Solomon. He may have been a foreign king. It really doesn't matter. This king, King Lemuel, whoever he may be, was looking back at a very critical, a very pivotal moment in his reign. A moment when he was either on the verge of making some very serious, consequential decisions in his life, or a moment when he had just begun to enter into those choices. Either way, at a strategic moment, his mother steps in and says, What are you doing, son? What are you doing, son of my womb? 
Son of my vows, what are you doing with the life that God has given you? You know better than this. You've sat at the feet of Solomon. You know the wisdom that has been passed on to you. What are you doing giving your strength? Strength there is not physical strength. Why are you giving the best years of your life? Why are you giving the talents and the abilities that God has given to you? Why are you giving the best years of your life? Why are you giving this opportunity that the Father has granted to you to reign over this nation? Why are you giving your ways to the ways of a strange woman who will ultimately ruin and destroy your life? I have to believe that this mother knew Proverb 14 and verse number 1. And she knew that the woman that her son was courting at that time was not a God-fearing woman. And knew that eventually giving his ways to her would be his undoing and bring him destruction in his life. But understanding how important a good wife is... She actually went on to counsel him on the kind of woman that he should be looking for, the kind of woman that would be a blessing to him. A woman who in the end would be praised by her children, who would be praised by her husband, and would possess a moral beauty that would cause her to stand out among all the other women of the kingdom. She told him, son, charm is deceitful, beauty is in vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. She said, son, I know she's charming. I know she's alluring. And every time you look in those baby blue eyes of hers, you melt like wax. And I know she's drop dead gorgeous. And the moment she walks in the room, she stuns everybody with her beauty. But son, I'm telling you, Don't be deceived by her charm. Son, don't be lured away by her beauty. Watch out, boy. She'll chew you up. She's a (laughs) man-eater. She will wreck your life. Because that charm is going to go away one day. And that beauty is going to fall in all places. But a woman who fears the Lord shall never fail you. And she'll make you the man that God called you to be. Come on. She says, son, there's a moral beauty that can only be found in a lady who fears the Lord. You know, when we talk about the fear of the Lord, and and we said this last week, the fear of the Lord... It's not being afraid of God unless you don't know Christ as your Savior. I I hate to be the bearer of bad news even here on Mother's Day, but if you do not know the Father through Jesus Christ as Lord and Son, the Bible makes it clear the wrath of God now abides on you. And if you die in that state, you'll be lost for eternity. The good news here is that you don't have to. Through Jesus Christ and his magnificent love, you can come out from under that wrath and be birthed into the kingdom of Almighty God in Jesus' name. So there is hope. Can you give God the praise for that if you believe it? But for the child of God, the fear of the Lord, we know, is not being afraid of him. As we said last week, it is having a reverential and worshipful awe of his greatness. It is being so captured with the greatness and the majesty and the purity of God that you have an undying love for him. It is a loving fear. It is such a high regard and respect for him that you would never think of doing anything or saying anything or going anywhere or posting anything or whatever it is you do this day. You would never do anything that, you would, that would grieve the heart of God. You would always take it through that filter. Lord, does this honor you? Does Does this praise you? Does this reveal your great character to the world that I live in today? 
And ladies, you are called to walk in the fear of the Lord. And that's not just an Old Testament concept either. That is a New Testament concept. In fact, when Peter was writing to ladies, listen to what he said. In 1 Peter 3, in verse number 3, he says, Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with a beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and they accepted the authority of their husbands. I love that. Peter Peter just says, ladies, ladies, just don't stress yourself out on keeping yourself attractive outwardly. Instead, look for the beauty that comes from within, an unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That's how the women of the Old Testament made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and they accepted the authority of their husbands. Now, I don't want to take any liberties here on the Word of God. I don't want to add to. I don't want to take away. But I think it's safe to say, ladies, that Peter was not prohibiting women from doing their hair nice and having some fine pieces of jewelry and even having some nice clothes. I don't think he was prohibiting that. I think it's all right, ladies, for you to keep yourself beautiful and and attractive. I don't think he's prohibiting it. What he's doing is saying, don't make it a priority. I don't want you to get so caught up in the external beauty that you forget God's not impressed with that. He's looking at your heart. He's watching and, and he's looking in there and true beauty in the eyes of God is measured by possessing that quiet, that gentle spirit who trusts God and accepts the authority of the husband that God has blessed them with. A God-fearing woman who can find her. That's what the Bible says. She is so rare that, that only God can direct a man to find her in Jesus' mighty name. So here's what I want to do with the balance of our time. I want to look at three characteristics. In no way, shape, or form do I believe there are only three. But I want to just share with you from Proverbs 31, three characteristics of a God-fearing woman. Not just God-fearing mother, but a God-fearing woman. So ladies, this is for all of you. Whether, again, you're married or not or have children or not, this is for you. Because God has called you to live a life where you fear the Lord. And you do have this gentle, quiet spirit. And that you trust God completely. And if you are married or should you be married, that you accept willingly the authority of your husband. There are three characteristics I see here of a God-fearing woman. A woman who fears the Lord first is a woman of valor. She's a woman of valor. I want you to take courage in that because, again, the imagery here could make you sound like you just have to walk lowly every day. No, a, a, a woman who fears the Lord is a woman of valor. How do I know that? Proverbs 31, verse number 10. This, again, is another mother speaking to her son, and she says, An excellent wife who can find. That word excellent means so much more than what we see it in in the English language. The word excellent in the Hebrew means strength. It means skill. It means army. It's translated in other places as warrior. And it even means valor. All of these are military words. So ladies, he sees you as being strong. In fact, it takes great strength to be gentle and quiet when the world is going crazy. It takes great strength and great intestinal fortitude forged in Jesus Christ to raise children the way that God wants them to be raised in this hour. You are not a wimp. You are a warrior. Can I hear a good amen out of our ladies today? You are a woman who fears the Lord, and and fearing the Lord, you fear nothing and no one else. 
A woman of valor possesses the strength and the skill that is necessary to fight for her family. Ladies, I'm going to tell you, it takes courage to be a godly woman today. Oh, can I hear a better amen than that, ladies, okay? It takes courage to be a godly woman today because everything in the culture today flies rebelliously in the face of the clear teachings of Christ that emerge from the Word of God. You are in a war, ladies, and you are on the front lines of that war. And too often we just look to men, but God put you strategically on the front lines and has gifted you to be women of valor fighting against Against what is happening in this country and to say as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord in Jesus mighty name the woman who fears the Lord courageously fights through the politics and the policies and the feelings and the emotions and she stands as a priceless lady of great worth for the glory of almighty God Ladies, it takes great valor, great courage, a warrior spirit to submit to a husband and trust God completely, especially when you believe your husband is making a bad decision or is taking you in a wrong direction, and yet God has commanded you to submit to that leadership. It takes courage, but you have to believe in your heart that if I do what God told me to do, that he will honor that obedience and will make a way where there seems to be no other way. That takes courage. Can I hear a good amen? It takes courage to raise your daughters to be precious young ladies and enjoy their God-given femininity. It is, takes courage to raise boys to be respectful gentlemen and to not lord over their ladies, but to treat them with dignity and respect in Jesus' name. And it takes great courage to keep godly peace and joy in the home. It's a fight, but ladies, God has given you all that you need to stay Stand in this hour and be who God called you to be in Jesus' mighty name. You know, Ruth, who would have been King David's great-grandmother, was known as a woman of valor. Now, many of you know Ruth's story, and I'm not going to go through it here today, but she became widowed. Her husband, which would have been Naomi's son, died, and by right, she could have just abandoned her mother-in-law. She had no legal ties to her, any obligations at all. But even being widowed, she clung to her Jewish mother-in-law, Naomi. And remember what she said to her very famously. She said to her, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Your people are going to become my people, and your God is going to be my God. And we just read those words, and we think nothing of it. But what she was saying is, I'm going to leave Moab. I'm going to leave my family. I am going to leave what I am comfortable with. I'm going to leave what I found my safety and my security in, and I'm going to follow you to a land I don't even know anything about. But I make this commitment to you this day. I'm going to trust in God and wherever you go, I'm going to go. And wherever you lodge, I'm going to lodge. We're in this together. Your people are going to be my people. Your God is going to become my God. And when they got back to Bethlehem, she had carved out such a reputation in that community that Boaz, who would become her future husband, at this point wasn't. But if you know the story, he is a type of God the Father and Christ our Savior. And he says to her, I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And that word worthy is the same word in Proverbs 31, excellent, which means a woman of valor. He says, I'm going to pay attention to what you ask because you are a woman of valor. You are a warrior and great things are going to be in your heart and your life. And ladies, you've got to believe God that you can cut ties with all the things you once found security and safety in and follow God and say, Lord, 
Lord, I may not understand where you've taken me. And I may not understand the man that is my husband right now. But I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to believe that somehow you're going to make a way where there seems to be no other way. Because there is nothing too difficult for you in Jesus' name. That's a woman of valor. And that's what God has called you to be as you fear him. Secondly, if you fear the Lord, you are a woman of value. A value. A woman who fears the Lord is a woman of value. We'll point that here out in just a second. You know, I don't know how the process is today, but in, in that day when you took raw gold and you threw it into the furnace and you melted it down, all of the impurities that were hidden deep within the recesses of that gold would surface to the top. You would skim it out, and then solid, pure gold would come forth. Can I tell you that the fear of the Lord is like that refining fire. The fear of the Lord melts our heart, and it brings to the surface all of the unseen impurities that are there so it can be skimmed off, and that what comes forth is a solid gold character and ladies when you submit yourself to the fear of the Lord he'll melt your heart for good he'll bring to the surface all of the things that tear down and destroy he'll be wiped out so that you can come forth as precious stones for the glory and the honor of God and that's why Proverbs 31 and verse number 10 says she is far more precious than jewels I love that why do we pay a lot of money for precious jewels? Because they're rare. Because they're not easily found. They have to be discovered. They have to be unearthed. They have to be processed. There's a lot of work that goes into those precious stones. And so you are unique. A woman who fears the Lord is not easily found, is not easily discovered. It's rare that you can find a godly woman today. And you need to see what, what value you bring. Listen, the heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Ladies, can I tell you what you bring to the family, all the money in the world cannot buy. Husband can't buy trust. He can't buy emotional and mental gain. He can't buy goodness. But you can bring that all to him. When you walk in the fear of the Lord. It is impossible to calculate the value of a God-fearing wife. The husband of a God-fearing wife trusts her completely. As I was meditating on that this week, I thought it was interesting because I've done enough counseling with, with husbands and wives that I know trust is a significant deal to a woman. And when that trust is compromised by her husband, whatever it might be that, that compromised it, it's very hard for that wife to ever recover that trust again. It's very significant. And I don't say that to your shame, ladies. That's how God created you. Because you're, you're giving your life for your husband. The, the, the very created purpose for a wife is to be a helpmate to her husband. That's what Genesis tells us. That was the origin, was to come alongside. doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan for you, but God uniquely gifted and talented you so that if you were to marry, you would compliment your husband, that you would come alongside him and build him up and the family as well. That's your created purpose. And again, I, I'm not suggesting God doesn't have a plan for you he certainly does but that first obligation is that and evidently trust as important as it is to you because you're, you're trusting so much in this marriage trust is that important to a man as well listen I'm not here to, to, to say that it's harder to be a man or a, uh, harder to be a woman that's we're not going to debate that I can just tell you as a man that the pressures of being a man are great. 
even so much that I'm sweating now more than I usually do because I'm a man preaching to ladies. And, and, and the way we're portrayed today, some of you have already dismissed, well, he's a guy. And, and I'm just trying to be biblical here. The pressures of being a man are great. What a relief it is to have a wife that can be trusted. It's one less thing we got to worry about. He, <laughs> yeah. he lacks nothing, the Bible says. Now, that, that doesn't mean that you're paying us or you're making money for us. It's just we lack nothing of emotional and mental strength because the, there is just something about the relief that a wife brings when she can be trusted. She does him only good, no harm, as long as she lives, which means she brings nothing into the home, nothing into the marriage, nothing into the family, nothing into the children that in would any way harm them. She does only good. Now, you know that from time to time I love bragging on my wife. And listen, I know that all of you, I'm trying to, like, I don't know that all of you feel this way, but I know that many of you men feel the exact same way that I do about your wife, okay? It's just that I have a mic. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. So just, can you give me a moment just to brag on my wife, even though I know it makes her tremendously uncomfortable when I do this. I thank God for my wife. And I think that what I am more amazed about my wife, Kathy, when I think about her, is, is the fact, and many of you know this, Kathy wasn't raised in a Christian home. And I'm not saying anything that, that um, was meant to be demeaning. I, I just know that that was a concern of even my mom and dad, is, is that Kathy was not raised in a Christian home. I never knew my mother-in-law. My, my mother-in-law passed away before Kathy and I even met. Um, she passed away the first day of Kathy's senior year in high school. I knew my father-in-law, Ken, who loved his, his uh, children. Ken was a World War II vet, and he was very much a World War II generation guy, didn't talk a lot, um, didn't really show a lot of emotion, um, not a lot of affection, but he deeply loved his children. Kathy wasn't raised in a Christian home, had no godly example growing up, but for whatever reason, when she was a little girl and she's the baby of her family, she had a desire to be in church. And to their credit, both Ken and Vela, her mom, they arranged to get Kathy to church every Sunday. They didn't stay. They dropped her off and went back home. But to their credit, they did not squash that desire within her, but made a way for her to be in the house of the Lord. And at a, a, a late teens, Kathy surrendered her life to Jesus Christ. And, and uh, I met her, uh, like I said, my freshman year, her senior year. And then we got married. Well, we, we started dating, I should say, right after I graduated from high school. So it was a, it, it was a progression. Okay. I told you before, Kathy wasn't that impressed with me when we first <laughs> met. That's, that's the truth, you know. But I got the last laugh. Amen. So, but... Uh, but I say this in all honesty, that over these last 33 years, my wife has done nothing that brought me harm. She never did anything that I had to explain. She never did anything that I had to uh, clean up a mess. For 33 years, she has done me nothing but good. And that is because now she's, not that she's perfect, but she walks in the reverent and the worshipful fear of the Lord. And ladies, yeah, give God the praise. That's, that's for her. Ladies, I, I can't tell you how much that's worth. I mean, I, I have spent the better part of my life now under public scrutiny. You cannot imagine how relieving it is to know that I don't have to be worried about her making a mess of things and damaging my reputation or our family 
She's been humble, and God has honored that humility in Jesus' name. Give God all the praise in Jesus' name. And then finally, I'll give you this last one. A woman who fears the Lord is a woman of vision. Is a woman of vision. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs that a wise man sees the danger ahead and hides himself. It doesn't say anything about the fear of the Lord, but last week we learned that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So a woman who walks in the fear of the Lord, she just naturally knows that there is trouble coming ahead. And she hides herself in the presence of God. She doesn't hide in fear. uh, David said, you are my hiding place. So she hides herself in Christ because she knows danger's coming. And she's got to get ready for that. Listen to the visionary language here. And I'm reading this. This is Proverb 31. But I'm reading it out of the Amplified Version. She girds herself with strength spiritual, mental, and physical fitness for her God-given task and makes her arms strong and firm. She tastes and sees that her gain from work with and for God is good. Her lamp goes not out, but it burns on continually through the night. And the Amplified reminds us that this is not to be taken necessarily physically, though it certainly is implied that it's more spiritual. Because he said, what does it mean to burn your light continually through the night? The night of trouble, privation, or sorrow, which warns away all fear, doubt, and distrust. She fears not the snow for her family, for all her household are doubly clothed in scarlet. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and her position is strong and secure. She rejoices over the future, the latter day or time to come, knowing that she and her family are in readiness for it. I love that. Because she fears the Lord, she fears nothing else. And so she is a woman of valor, and she sees the evil day approaching, so she keeps the light of God's word burning brightly in every season of her life and strengthens herself with dignity and honor. She takes her position in Christ, in her family, and stands with absolutely no fear of what the future may hold because she knows that she and her family are ready for it in Jesus' mighty name. God-fearing moms know that crises are right around the corner that hardships and strife and disagreement and even sadly the falling away of children will happen so she burns the midnight oil in prayer and she fights the good fight of faith because she has a vision not only of what is coming but the one who promised he would be there when it came in Jesus mighty name that is a God fearing woman She's visionary. I love the imagery there. She rejoices when she sees winter coming. She rejoices in the future because she knows that she's leveraged all of the precious gifts and talents that God has given her so that she'd be ready, so that her family would be ready. She spoke into their lives and she said, you know what, I've taken the time to do what God told me to do and now I know God is going to do what he promised he would do in Jesus' mighty name. Can you give God the praise if you believe that this morning? The year was 1820, and Peter Richley was running from his old life in England. He had become greatly dissatisfied with his uneventful life, and he struck out to start again in Australia. And what happened? has got to be one of the strangest and most harrowing events known to mankind. I kid you not, this is a true story. I would not have believed it if I had not studied it. Even when I read it, I just said, you know, this cannot be true. I assure you, it is a documented fact. The ship which Peter richly had been traveling on sank. But miraculously, he was rescued. But by some strange twist of circumstance, the rescuing ship sank as well. He was rescued again. But the third ship sank the same way. 
he was rescued a third time. Yet his fourth ship, it soon sank as well. Unbelievably, he was rescued a fourth time. But the fifth ship sank as well. But by this time, Peter Richley, by his own testimony, just floated with supreme confidence, believing that somehow God did not want him to die on the sea. And sure enough, as if on cue, another ship came and saved him, answering his call for help. The ocean liner that finally brought him to safety was called the City of Leeds. Leeds, L-E-E-D-S, which is a northern city in England, which was where this ocean liner was constructed. It was bound from England to Australia and was traveling the very same sea lane as Peter Richley's downed ships. The crew hoisted him aboard. They warmed him up, gave him dry clothing. They took him to the ship's doctor. He looked him over, ran some primitive tests. Remember, this is 1820, but declared him good, you know, that he was fine and fit. And then the doctor said, Peter Richley, I got a really strange favor to ask of you. And Peter Richley said, well, how can I deny that God saved me for some reason? So what is it you would have me do? He says, you know what? There's an elderly lady aboard this ocean liner. Shortly after we took off from England, she fell very sick and has developed a fever we cannot control. She's moving in and out of delirium. And all she keeps saying is, I want to see my son again. Don't let me die until I see my son again. Don't let me die until I see my son again. And the doctor said she knows everybody on board, so we can't pull a fast one on her. But she doesn't know you. Would you mind posing as her son and maybe bringing relief to a dying woman? She's not going to make it. Well, Peter Richley thought about that for a moment, and he said, you know what? How can I deny this opportunity that's been given to me? If it will comfort a dying woman, I will do it. So the doctor takes her, or takes him, to this lady's stateroom. And Peter walks in, and she can, he can see her silvery white hair, and he goes over and he hears her, God, please don't let me die till I see my son again. God, please don't let me die till I see my son again. So Peter richly went over, took her hand, and looked into her face, and immediately fell to his knees, weeping. Because lying in that bed was the reason he couldn't seem to die in the ocean. Lying on that bed was his lifeline in the sea that wouldn't allow him to drown. Because lying in that bed was Sarah Richley, his mother, who'd been praying for him nonstop for 10 years that she'd see her boy one last time and that he would come to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And right there in the bowels of that boat, Peter richly cried out to Jesus Christ, was gloriously saved, his mother's fever left, and they were reunited in Jesus' mighty name. <laughs> Never underestimate the power of a mama's prayer. I believe only eternity will reveal the storms I made it through, the times I was rescued from certain destruction because my mama was praying for me, because my grandmother was praying for me, because my great-grandmother was praying for me in Jesus' name. And I know some of you ladies, some of you guys, you're thinking, but 
my mom never knew the Lord. My grandmother never knew the Lord. My great-grandmother never knew the Lord. There was nobody praying for me. No, 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 no. There's someone praying for you. I told you my wife wasn't raised in a Christian home. As far as we know, there were no Christians there and none that were really praying for her. But you know what? My mom was praying for her. My grandmother was praying for her. My great-grandmother. You say, well, they didn't know her back then. Yeah, long before Kathy ever came into the picture, they were praying, Lord, Kurt's going to get married one day. Would you protect her? We don't know where she is, but would your hands guide her? Would your hands direct her? Would you save her and direct her one day to Kurt so that they can have a marriage that glorifies you? Someone was praying for you in Jesus' name. Can somebody give God the praise? And that's why it says in verse 27, Proverb 31, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She knows the ways of her sons. She knows the ways of her daughters. She knows the ways of her husband. She knows the ways of their home. And rather than sitting idly by, she's praying. She's interceding because she wants her family strong and secure in Jesus' name. And that's why her children rise up and they bless her and her husband blesses her and praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. You know, when I read that, ladies, the thought came to me, you may not see the fruit of your prayers. You may not see the fruit of your labors sometimes get weary and just feel like giving up. But one day you're going to be at the gates of heaven and you're going to see the fruit of your prayers, the fruit of your labor, the fruit of your faithfulness. Don't give up. Woman of valor, fight in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, can you give God all the praise and all the glory? Come on, you can do better than that. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Would you all stand this morning? And I'm going to ask not only our moms, but I'm going to ask all of our ladies because this was a message not just for moms, it's all of our ladies. It's a young, old, married, single. I want all of our ladies to come forward here today. We're all going to end up down here eventually, but would you all just, ladies, just come down here and just stand all across. Press in as close as you possibly can. Now, is there anyone that is going to deny the power of a woman when they see how many ladies are in this building right now? Look at that. Guys, how many of you are thankful for our ladies, our daughters, our moms, our wives? Now, guys, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If, if you have a wife here, a mother here, a sister here, whatever the case may be, a, a daughter, can you come and do your best to find them? Can you do that? Just I told you, we'd, this is going to be a super spreader event. I don't, <laughs> I don't care. Hopefully, the only thing we spread here today is the power of God. Amen. That's what we need. Come on, press through. Just say, excuse me. We're all friends here today. If you can, I know it's, it's really tight here. Do your best. Gentlemen, before I even offer a prayer, would, would you pray for your wife, for your mother, for again, your sister, for your daughter, whatever relationship they may be? Would you just lift up your voice, guys? And, and I'm going to pray over them in a moment. But you lift up your voice. Come on. I want to hear the men. Come on, guys. Lift up your voice and pray for them. Let them hear you praying for them in Jesus' mighty name.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Be ready to go with it. Hallelujah. Precious Father in heaven, I thank you for each one of these precious ladies that stand here today. They are precious in your sight and they have been uniquely gifted. They have been uniquely touched by God to bring a blessing, Lord, to this world we live in today. Lord, we know that you are the one who blesses. No one work with men and women to bring blessing into the earth. And you have specifically designed ladies to bring something into this world that men aren't. Pray, Father, that ladies would look in the fear of the Lord. I don't know why this mic. <laughs> that our ladies would walk in the reverent, worshipful fear of the Lord. And that they would not be intimidated and backed down by the spirit of this age. But they would say, I know in whom I have believed in. And I am persuaded that he is able. And he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think or imagine. So I am not going to trust in my own heart and my own understanding, but in all of my ways. I'm going to acknowledge the Lord and live as he called me to live and believe that he's going to make a way where there seems to be no other way. Father, I pray that they would not grow weary in doing well, for they will reap if they faint not. And we thank you for them in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said amen and amen. Yeah, give them praise. You can praise properly your wife. That's what the Bible says. Amen.